10 years on. Um, the best evidence that we have is that it was this first year um, in the big city that he became infected with syphilis that eventually led to his madness. Um, he first studied at Bonn, he first studied theology and then classical philology, again, this is an analysis of ancient texts. Um, but in 1865, um, he followed his favorite teacher to the University of Leipzig. Um, and there, he studied Schopenhauer, who had died just a few years earlier in 1860, and Wagner, who was very much alive, uh, and had recently returned to Prussia after being exiled um, out, of, out of Prussia. Uh, and Schopenhauer and Wagner became decisive influences on his early career. He really became a devotee of both of them. He was then hired by a uh, university in Basel um, to their chair in classical philology, so the study of ancient classical texts. He did this, he was hired before he even completed his, his uh, thesis at age 24. So this was the youngest person. He was a star. He was the up and coming um, classical philologist. Um, and by all accounts, he was absolutely a brilliant um, philologist. In 1870, um, he volunteered for military service during the Franco Prussian War. He was a medical orderly, um, and he became very ill during uh, his time here. And this was really the beginning of uh, what was a lifetime of serious illnesses. He was discharged from the army after only a couple of months. Okay, his first book was published in 1872, so this is just a few years after he was hired as the star uh, young philologist. This was um, the birth of tragedy, actually, the birth of tragedy from the spirit of music. Um, and this was a very, very peculiar book for a young philologist to publish. Um, so this is uh, a classicist. This is a guy whose work is in the study of ancient um, Greek and Roman uh, texts. And this book contains um, no footnotes, no references, or any Greek quotations whatsoever. And even more strange than that, the last third of the book uh, is devoted largely to the claim that the music of the operas of Richard Wagner represent a rebirth of classical Greek tragedy. Um, so at this time, Nietzsche was completely enamored with Wagner. He became a frequent guest of Wagner, Wagner and uh, who lived nearby. Um, and furthermore, this book went completely against the grain of philosophy at the time, which was thinking of itself as a kind of scientific discipline. Um, later in his life, he called the book, quote, badly written, Nietzsche called his own book. Badly written, ponderous, embarrassing, image mad, and image confused, sentimental, in places saccharine to the point of effeminacy, uneven in tempo, without the will to logical cleanliness, very convinced and therefore very disdainful of proof. Um, the contemporary reviews agree with that assessment. And basically, uh, the publication of this first book ruined his academic career. So very, very briefly, the basic idea of this book was that um, Greek tragedy was built up from the tension between two different principles, which he called Apollonian and Dionysian. Um, so the Apollonian principle was what treats the individual person as separate from the rest of reality, able to stand back and detach from reality, and contemplate it in a rational and orderly and detached manner. 
The domination principle, on the other hand, treats the individual as caught up and overwhelmed in the frenzy of the chaotic world. Um, and Nietzsche thought that a proper balance of these two principles um, is what's necessary in order to be able to make sense of one's life, to have a, a, a resolution to the problems of, of one's life. Um, the villain of the book um, really was Socrates, who emphasized the Apollonian principle. Um, and the influence of Socrates on authors like Euripides, for example, um, overemphasized this detached, rational dimension and effectively killed Greek tragedy. Um, and since then, he argued, Western culture has been committed to the view that the ultimate structure of the universe, the ultimate metaphysical, metaphysical picture of the world was rational. And therefore, the many flaws of the world are simply um, a part of the appearance of things, the mere appearance of things, not their underlying metaphysical reality. Themselves and the world of, uh, of experience and appearance. Okay, well, so at this point, Nietzsche concludes, Wagner is our best hope. He rejects this rationalism, um, and this is why uh, Wagner is, is the hope of overcoming the last two millennia of um, the states. Okay. Um, It's all down from him um, in terms of his personal life, in terms of his illness, in terms of his career, in terms of his uh, recognition and career. Um, he sank down into loneliness and ill health. He quickly came to believe that he had vastly overstated um, German culture, and in particular Wagner. And he wrote in the aftermath of this debacle, um, four essays that were published collectively under the title of Untimely Meditations. Sometimes it's translated as unfashionable observations. Um, and these were essays that were initially published uh, separately between 1873 and 1876, brought together um, um, in a book called Untimely um, and as I said, this was, I'll skip over this, but this was the beginning of the, his, the reassessment of his earlier cultural and philosophical opinions. Um, at this time, there were also two other essays that he wrote um, that were in the, very much in the same style of these essays. Um, Um, and, but which he chose not to publish. Uh, and I do, just want to mention one of these to you. Um, it's called On Truth and Lies in a Non-Moral Sense. I just mentioned this to you because this has been um, something that's quite, this essay has become quite popular among the postmodern interpretation I alluded to before. Um, because here he tries to present an account of truth as metaphor truth as a kind of form of metaphor. And he writes famously here in this essay, truths are illusions which have, sorry, truths are illusions which we have forgotten are illusions. Um, okay, so this is emphasized by uh, those who want to take his project to be a debunking. In um, 1878, um, he published a work called Human, All Too Human. And this was his first aphoristic work. Um, this was 
consisted of 638 brief sections, sentence or paragraph at most. Um, and I want to read you um, uh, the first quote on the handout um, from, from Human Role to Human. Um, and this is, uh, this was sort of the inauguration of a period of reevaluation of science, reevaluation of um, empirical uh, knowledge, and the beginnings of his rejection of anything like a deep metaphysics. Um, so here he's beginning the process of rejecting deep speculative metaphysical views in favor of sort of ordinary, more mundane, naturalistic, empirical science. And you can see that in this first aphorism here, number three. He says, it's called the estimation of unpretentious truths. So unpretentious truths are sort of the ordinary, mundane, empirical truths that we get from what we might think of as normal science, as opposed to wild, speculative, deep, philosophical truths. He says this, he says, it's the mark of a higher culture to value the little unpretentious truths which have been discovered by means of rigorous method more highly than the errors handed down by metaphysical and artistic ages and men, which blind us and make us happy. At first, the former, that is the ordinary, mundane, unpretentious truths that we get at through a disciplined method. At first, the former are regarded with scorn as though the two things could not possibly be accorded equal rights. The mundane, ordinary, empirical truths, and the deep, important, philosophical, metaphysical truths. They stand there so modest, simple, sober, so apparently discouraging, while the latter are so fair, splendid, intoxicating, perhaps indeed enrapturing. Yet, that which has been attained by laborious struggle and certain enduring, sorry, by laborious struggle, the certain enduring and thus significance for any further development of knowledge is nonetheless the higher. To adhere to it is manly and demonstrates courage, simplicity, abstemiousness. So it's through the boring, disciplined, hard work of running experiments over and over, that little by little we accumulate empirical knowledge. We accumulate knowledge of how the world is. And this is actually far more heroic than wild speculative metaphysics that purport to tell us how the deep, true world is. Um, this is also in human, all too human. So look, uh, so human, all too human, right? So this is supposed to be an investigation into the actual functioning of empirical human beings. Um, and it's not such a pretty sight when you actually look with a clear eye at human beings. Um, and this was also the beginning of his break with Schopenhauer as well. Um, and this would be a long, drawn-out process. Um, uh, this sort of rejection of deep metaphysics also introduces, for the first time, the so-called perspectivism. We'll talk about that later. Um, and he also... It's part of his break with Schopenhauer. Um, and it's also 